So the United States is in the middle of an arms race. And not a lot of people, I, I think, uh, know about it yet. Um, in the Cold War, of course, we were in an arms race with the Soviet Union, especially in the 50s and 60s, over nuclear missiles. And in the 1960 election, uh, John Kennedy coined a phrase called the missile gap. Uh, that was a myth, but I want to talk to you about something that I think is a real problem for national security today, which I call the strategic AI gap. Uh, that, that's the strategic artificial intelligence gap, of course. Um, to do that, I sort of want to do three things. First, I want to tell you about my story for why I got interested in this topic. Then I want to talk to you a little bit about what the issue means. And then third, I'd like to talk about what we should do about it, our path forward in, in light of this issue. And so I actually got interested in this uh, pretty much by accident. February of 2018, uh, by, by luck, I was having dinner with alumnus of this college, and he had asked me what I thought the most important national security issue was facing the United States. I told him that, quite frankly, I didn't know. I, uh, I, I rejected the... Uh, the sort of commonplace wisdom at the time that's increasingly growing common that it was China, because I thought that their population decline and the insustainability of their economic growth would prevent them from being a major competitor to the United States uh, before they had really ever gotten to that position. He told me something different, and I have to admit that at first I dismissed it. He thought artificial intelligence was the greatest national security threat facing the US. Uh, I dismissed it and didn't think about it for a few months until one of my friends showed me uh, Sam Harris's TED Talk, actually, on artificial intelligence. And pretty soon, I was listening to all of the episodes he had on his podcast about the issue, and I got hooked. Uh, there was one story that really gripped me into it that made me think about it. Uh, the idea being that if Google, Facebook, one of the big Silicon Valley companies announced tomorrow that they had developed an artificial general intelligence, an AI capable of general problem solving, like you or I are. There would be pretty good reason for an enemy of the US, Russia, China, what have you, to take a tactical nuclear strike against Silicon Valley. That caught my attention. The logic of it runs something like this. If there was an AI that had the general intelligence capabilities of a team of university researchers, uh, just because of how silicon circuits work versus how our brain circuits work, it would be able to work about a million times faster, which means in the course of, of a 15-minute talk, uh, an artificial general intelligence like this could do nearly 30 years of work. That's a lot. Uh, and while when it came into existence, it wouldn't have, like Athena, all the strategic knowledge that, human has, that humanity has built up, but it could read Klaus Witzitz on war in a fraction of a second. It's an open question, then, how long such a system would take before it could figure out where all of our enemies' nuclear weapons were stored, such that we could take them out with perfect accuracy. Obviously, no state would want that to happen, because then they would be at the whims of the, of the United States. And so it would be reasonable for them to want to take out that system before it had time to solve that issue. Now, I want to talk about AI specifically looking at 2030, because China has stipulated, or has said and laid out, that they want to be the world's leader in military AI by that point. Uh, now, when we're looking at the timescale of 2030, we're not really looking at artificial general intelligence. Unfortunately, C-3PO and R2-D2 are not the droids we're looking for. <laughs> Rather, what we're looking at is what's considered narrow artificial intelligence. Um, but narrow artificial intelligence can still do quite a bit. Uh, if any of you have heard about uh, AlphaGo, uh, well, first of all, I should explain probably what Go is. It's, it's an ancient Chinese board game where you take white and black stones and you place them on a board, attempting to gain territory, and the person who has the most territory at the end of the game wins. It's considered to be far more complicated than chess. And in 2016, AlphaGo was an AI system that was able to beat the then world champion at it. And this happened uh, years before experts thought it would, and there were some experts who didn't even think it would ever be possible. Um, but it happened in 2016, three years ago. And since then, AI progress has only continued. AlphaGo and its successor systems have only gotten better. And so when you think about military AI, before we get to general intelligence, there's still issues of what an AI can do with strategy, because Go is a strategy game. And so similarly, if you were to create a sufficiently advanced computer war game, 
say it was modeling naval warfare, or say it was modeling drones. You could then train an AI on that system, and through enough iterations, it would develop strategy to be able to control a drone fleet that can take down uh, an army with sort of air artillery, or, or a drone navy that can strategically maneuver in the seas, and given the speed and power that AI has, ex has demonstrated against human strategists, there's every reason to think that they would be better than a purely human general board uh, making the strategy that their military would be using. And so the main point of that is to say that military AI will be one of the most decisive factors in strategy in the coming few years. 2030 sounds like it's a long ways off. It's 11 years off. And I'd like to remind you that just 11 years ago is when the financial crisis happened. Which is to say 2030 is a lot closer than you might otherwise think. So just a few more points on this issue, for example. Um, when, in 2017, that's when China laid out their uh, annual, national, or annual artificial intelligence national security strategy. And it was in that that they said they wanted to have dominance by 2030. In the year following that, they increased their expenditures in AI research by about 67%. As of October in 2018, uh, Chinese companies totaled about 48% of the market share in artificial intelligence. United States companies totaled about 38%, which means uh, the gap that China and the or that China has over the United States in terms of artificial intelligence investment is increasing, and China especially wants to use this for. For strategic purposes. They think the US is going to continue focusing on stealth fighter jets, going to continue focusing on aircraft carriers, and they think artificial intelligence, given the strategic advantage that it would give them, presents an opportunity for them to leapfrog ahead of US uh, military and national security technology. So why is this important at all? Uh, obviously, if, if you're going to be a, a sort of American patriot, and where you think America just means number one, you're going to have a visceral reaction against anyone leading America in, adva in an advanced technology like artificial intelligence. But even if you don't believe that, there's still cause for concern. When you look at what China has done with detaining millions of ethnic minorities from its western regions, uh, or its goals to build a security state that makes Oceania in 1984 look benign, uh, there's significant reason to question wanting China's values to be able to spread across the world. So the biggest solution, or perhaps the, the most powerful way to prevent that from happening is to invest more in artificial intelligence. Now some of you may know in January, President Trump signed an executive order that was supposed to increase funding for artificial intelligence in the United States. But it didn't actually raise, it didn't raise any new funding. All it did was request certain agencies to redirect funding, uh, which is to say this executive order didn't actually do much of anything. What we really need in facing down this issue, uh, in facing down this AI uh, gap that we face with China, is creative foreign policy. Uh, in the wake of World War II, America uh, created with the help of its war at wartime allies, a world order that has brought unprecedented peace and prosperity. Um, but at the time, the ideas that were presented were laughed at by the foreign policy establishment. What I'm suggesting is we need to have a similar uh, situation where we have creative foreign policy, creative statesmanship to handle this issue, given the values that the Chinese government want, seems to want to enforce on their own people the Uyghurs in uh, being the minority detained, or its surveillance state that it's approaching towards more and more every day. We have to face this down with creative new ways that, uh, that will involve more than merely increasing the investment we have in artificial intelligence. Uh, that is a prerequisite, I think. But there's also been rumors that there are a lot of mid-level Chinese officials that are growing concerned about the possibility of an AI arms race, given the strategic power artificial intelligence would have in military situations. People are growing concerned that if we actually apply this in a real world war, the consequences would be devastating. 
I think they're right. Unfortunately, for those mid-level uh, officials in China, however, most of the top-level officials still want to push on. They still want to push on with the research to take a decisive edge in strategic AI. But if the United States were to compete on this issue, if the United States were to compete and show you won't be able to gain a decisive edge, if you want to continue down this path, it's going to be a continued arms race that might very well bankrupt your economy. If the, if the United States were to begin down that path, there is the possibility that, like with the arms reduction treaties negotiated in the Cold War, we could negotiate with China, given that there are officials who are growing concerned about the possibility of this arms race uh, continuing on in the, into the future. And so, unfortunately, I don't have a perfect solution for what to do about the strategic AI gap, except to say that more of us should be thinking about it uh, in the United States, and that's one of the reasons why I intend to dedicate uh, at least the next few years of my life to researching this issue. But if I could leave you with anything, it's that this is an important issue. The fate of humanity, potentially, hangs in the balance for the 21st century. But it's also an issue we can solve. It's just going to take a little bit of creativity and a little bit of moxie. But America's done that in the past. I think America can do that in the future. I think America should do that in the future. So thank you.